Great. Thank you, Saurabh, and thank you to the organizers for letting me talk about this. We have a very full session, and I think a very good session, so I'm going to hustle right into it. Uh, I decided to leave out all the jokes, so you'll just have to imagine how funny I would have been if I had more time. Um, so I'm going to talk two quick stories. One is uh, purely computational, and the other one is purely experimental. They're both work in progress, although they'll hope, hopefully will be published before too long, but currently they're unpublished. The computational one has to do with improved methods for analyzing HT cell X or other kinds of uh, high throughput data to uh, obtain not just optimal parameters, but also confidence intervals on those parameters. Uh, so HT cell X or cell X seq or bind seq, this is a, a technique which was adapted from cell X, which has been around for a long time. This sounds really loud to me. Is it loud out there for you? <laughs> There's an echo. Maybe whoever's controlling the mic can turn it down a little bit. All right. Um, so the idea is you have a, a pool of DNA. It could be random or it could be genomic fragments or something. And um, you have an immobilized protein. You pass the DNA over it. Some of the DNA sticks to the protein. You separate bound and unbound. And then you're going to pull out the bounds and sequence them, and you can also sequence the prior DNA, uh, so you know what the initial pool was. And then you're going to try to get the motif by minimizing the, the data here. Let me pull up this. Actually, they want me to use this. So here's the data, the number of each sequence in the, in the pool. This is the model, the predicted number, and you want to minimize the difference between those two. So the prediction is down here. There are basically four kinds of parameters. There's a scaling factor A. There's a B, which is essentially a background or nonspecific binding. And then there's a, a weight matrix, or it could be a more complicated function, but some function that assigns an energy dependent upon the sequence. And there's a parameter mu, which has to do with the protein concentration. So those are the parameters you're trying to solve for. So it's a, basically a nonlinear regression method. And we, and we had published several years ago a method called BMO that, that worked pretty well uh, on this. Um, as I said, this, this method had, was invented more or less simultaneously by three different groups. But the group that really has pushed it the farthest is uh, Tapale in, uh, in Stockholm with collaborations with Tim Hughes and, and, and several other people. Um, in the initial paper, this 2010 paper, they did about, I think, 20 factors. And this more recent one, they've done over 200 factors. So they've really pushed this technology, uh, generated lots of data, lots of motifs. But as a person who has a long experience with motifs, when I look at these things, they look to me over-specified. Uh, most transcription factors are not that specific in what, in what they recognize. And looking back at how they did the algorithms that they used these, I can see why that's true. They really focused on the most uh, over-enriched uh, sequences, and, and they built their motifs on those. So we wanted to see if we could uh, develop a method that would take their data uh, and end up with motifs that we think are a little more uh, quantitative. Uh, we actually knew from a different project. So this is from a paper that we published last year, or actually earlier this year, on zinc finger proteins, where uh, this is for a particular factor, BCL6. Uh, there are four different motifs here. This is based on a ChIP-seq experiment. This is based on bacterial one hybrid. This bottom one is based on uh, uh, protein binding microarrays. And this is their published one. And you notice that they agree on what the consensus pattern is. But again, this looks like it's over-specified. And in fact, if you take these motifs and you go back to the ChIP-seq data and you ask how many peaks are identified in, on the motif that is discovered from the ChIP-seq data, you get about 74, or you get 74 peaks at a, at a given p-value cutoff. The B1H and the PBM both get about 50, and the, and the Select-seq motif that was published only gets about 40. So that, again, is an indication that the algorithms they're using are over-specifying the motifs. So anyway, we wanted to see if we could come up with an alternative algorithm uh, for that particular kind of data that might, might do better. And again, I, I, um, I think our BMO algorithm would probably have worked, but one of the things we also wanted to do was uh, end up with confidence intervals on the parameters and, and, and include some other flexibility. So this has been a collaboration with uh, Josh Swamidas, who's a professor in biomedical engineering, and my student, Shushang Ron. What we do is we start with an initial PWM. We actually start with the published ones, 
If you didn't have a published one, you could do something like meme, something that's quick, but it's probably going to give you a good approximation, Hope, probably not optimized, but a good approximation. We've shown that we can actually start de novo, but it takes longer, and it usually gets to the same answer. But if we start with something that's approximately good, and all we're trying to do is optimize the parameter, we actually get there quite quickly. Uh, we use this um, quasi-Newton uh, algorithm here, which uses the Hessian matrix for the gradient descent step. And that's important, which I'll come back to in just a second. So we run this algorithm. We optimize those parameters I talked about, the weight matrix for the, um, uh, for the protein specificity. We, we estimate the protein concentration, all that sort of stuff. And you know, like I said, hopefully we get optimal parameters. There's no guarantee. It's a nonlinear regression. Um, and what we've shown is that, and this is still work in progress, but on the particular data sets that we've looked at so far, we, when, we, when we ask how good a fit do we get to that complete raw data, we usually get R squareds of about 0.8 or so, which is compared to, to their methods only gives us R squareds of about 0.5. Now, if we just look at the top sequences, they're actually pretty similar because that's what they build their motif on. But if you try to explain the entire data set from the very high affinity sites all the way down to the low affinity sites, uh, we're fitting the data much better, which was what our goal was to give better quantitative models. Just, I want to just give a quick overview of what's going on. For those of you in machine learning, this will be pretty obvious. So f is our objective function, the, the least squares. Uh, g is the first derivative, which, op, which by definition goes to zero, and we've optimized the parameters. And h is the Hessian, which is the second derivative. Um, so that's used in the optimization procedure. But the important thing for this slide is to point out that the inverse of the Hessian matrix is the covariance matrix. So that gives us directly the, the confidence intervals on the parameters. The diagonal essentially gives you a, a confidence interval or a variance of the individual parameters. So we actually learn that uh, along with learning the parameters themselves. And in addition, the off-diagonal elements can tell us something about interactions between parameters. So we can get away from the strict additivity if we want to, but rather than sort of going through and testing lots of independent models, which we've done before, this gives us a hint right off the bat of which ones are likely to be the most important to follow up on. Okay, so that's the computational. I want to talk about a new experimental method, but first let me just revise what I just told you. So in the HT CellX method, you, get, you start with the initial pool and you sequence that. That goes into the equation here. You take the bound fraction, you sequence that, and that goes into the equation here, and that's related to this binding energy, which depends on the sequence plus the protein concentration. I've left out some other factors, but that's basically what the equation does. And what we care about really is not absolute binding affinity, but relative binding affinity. So if we define zero energy for the consensus sequence, then if we want to get relative affinity, it's, we're basically computing the ratio, the parameters that uh, fit this ratio. And um, this is not an easy, I mean, it's obviously a nonlinear regression that you have to do to fit this. It occurred to us later, unfortunately later, I wish I realized this early on, that if we do the experiment slightly differently, everything becomes a lot easier. So if instead of sequencing the prior, we sequence the unbound and the bound, and we put those in here, we get this equation. And in fact, since we care about is relative energy, uh, so we divide by some reference sequence, it, it just is e to the energy. And in fact, take a logarithm of that, and basically you, by just uh, sequencing the bound and unbound fractions compared to some reference ratio, you get the energies directly. Um, here's another way to represent the same things. So here's my test tube. I have lots of different variants of the sequence indicated by different colors. Uh, these little squiggles, different colors represent different affinity sites. I throw my protein in. I run a gel and I have a bound fraction and an unbound fraction. Over here I've got, you know, oops, back up. I have the basic binding reaction equation. Here's the definition of binding affinity. And what I care about, as I said, is relative affinity. So the protein concentration drops out. And this says the relative affinity for my entire pool of sequences, however many it is, is obtained simply by sequencing those two bands and computing ratios. Uh, so obviously, that's, that's easier. That's an experiment I could do. <laughs> I haven't yet, but I could. So let me tell you how we uh, tested this. The first experiment we did was with the LAC repressor. Uh, it's an interesting one, well, first of all, because it's well known. But in addition, when the, this is the, the standard lac repressor 01 here, 
It's an asymmetric binding site, even though the protein binds as a dimer, in fact, a tetramer, but the, the interaction here is with a dimer. And when it was first discovered, it was sort of curious that it was a, an asymmetric binding site. Uh, and in fact, in the middle 80s, uh, Jack Sadler's group actually tested whether it would bind better if you made it symmetric. And they made it symmetric in two ways. They deleted this middle base, and then they changed the right half to be the same as the left half, and it did bind slightly better. Well, uh, and, and since then, other people have done other things. We wanted to actually know what is the preferred binding site as a function of both the variable of the sequence and also the variability in the spacing. So we made a library in which we deleted the base here, like up there, and we randomized both halves of the, of the variable region here. We did two other libraries in which we left the three base pair spacer here, but we randomized the middle base, and we randomized either the entire right half of the operator or the entire left half of the operator. And then we did another one where we added an extra base uh, and again randomized the parts that were asymmetric in the initial one. So this library, this collection of libraries is a total of 2,500 different sequences. You, run one, you mix them all together with the protein, you run run gel, you cut out two bands and you sequence them. This uh, down here, I'm sorry, this is hard to read, but this is a measure of the reproducibility of the experiment. So these are two different experiments on the y-axis and the left axis. The protein concentrations are different, but remember I told you the protein concentration doesn't matter because we care about relative affinities. And what I'm showing you here is that the ratios compared to the reference sequence are consistent within about 5%. And if you convert that to energies, which we've done over here, in other words, we've just taken this data and taken the logarithm, and now zero is the consensus sequence, and the worst sequences go up, uh, this means that we can assay the binding energies within about 0.1 kT. Uh, that's the, that's the error bars on here. It's a little worse for the high, high, high energy or low affinity sites. Um, this is another replication experiment where now we're, sometimes the same sequence will occur in both orientations. And so we can again ask, do we get the same answer depending on independent of what the orientation is? And just in general, we get very high accuracy estimates of the binding energy. So what did we learn? So this is, confirms the, the thing I told you about from Stadler earlier. If I, if I leave out the middle base, I delete that one, I get the preferred sequence is this symmetric operator. And in fact, this is the highest affinity of all the sequences in our library. But it turns out it's only slightly better than the wild type. And of all possible sequences of the wild type, the one that has a three base pair spacer, the, the, the wild type sequence is in fact the best. So it actually prefers an asymmetric binding site as long as it has a three base pair spacer. And the, and the next interesting thing is if I add an extra base, again, it becomes symmetric, but now it prefers the right half of the wild type sequence instead of the left half. So up here, it prefers two copies of the left half because you have a two base spacer. And down here, it prefers two copies of the right half because it has a four base spacer. And if you go back and look at the, the structure by NMR, by, by Rob Captain's group, it, it actually uh, fits that structure quite well. What happens is the protein, which is a, you know, a, a, a homodimer, homodimer, but it's binding to two different sites. And in one site, what, what matters is the distance between this GC pair in the middle. And on one half, you have an extended form of the protein because it has to stretch out to reach it. On the left half, you have a compressed version of the protein. And if you have two compressed versions of the protein, you prefer this left half sequence. And if you have two versions of the extended operator, it prefers the right half sequence. And so what's happening is in the wild type case, it actually is uh, acting as a heterodimer, even though it's a homodimer. It, it is binding to the sequence in two different ways with two different preferences. Uh, this is, of course, I was just showing you sort of uh, individual logos. By the way, I'm not, this is an unusual logo or, or somewhat atypical. These were actually invented by uh, Harman and, uh, and Fote. They call them affinity logos. We refer to them energy logos. What's being plotted here is actually the energy, but negative energy, so the good guys are on top. So it looks like a standard logo in that way, but we're actually plotting the energy values here. Um, and so here we go back and we plot all the sequences. And uh, for each of the four different libraries. And I just want to point out one thing that we found very interesting, and that is over here, this is the, the, the two base pair spacer. What I'm showing here on, along this line are all the single mutants. And then uh, all the other points represent double and triple and quadruple mutants. 
The interesting thing is that all of these points are above the line. That is, they're, am I out of time already? <laughs> okay, sorry. So all the other points are above the line, which means that the binding is worse than you would predict by additivity. That's unusual. If you go back to the paper, like for instance, from Quake using Matomi, all the points that were off the diagonal were to the right. That is, you make double mutants and you actually, you're not as bad as you would have predicted, which sort of makes sense to me, and I expected that. When we see a re version like this, it's really unusual because you make two double mutants, it's actually worse than the additivity of both of them. We think we understand that now, and it's, I think it's an interesting story, but I don't have time to go into it. Let me just say that you can also do regression on the data. So this is the model just of the individual single mutants, but we could take all the data and do regression. And as you can see down here in the bottom, we actually get a pretty good fit that represents about, um, the variance here is about 0.5 KT, which is about as good as most experiments are. So in fact, if, if our experiment was sort of a typical experiment, we couldn't really tell whether the additivity model fit the data as well as possible. But the fact that we have very accurate data down to about 0.1 KT means we can distinguish between the two. Let me just jump ahead. We did a couple other proteins. We, as far as we can tell, you, the lac repressor of that family is unique in its ability to bind to things of different lengths and with different motifs. I just want to point out with my last slide that you can actually apply this to cases where you have complexes of proteins. <clears throat> so I have here I have a mixture of, of DNA that has binding sites for two proteins. And as long as I can see all four bands, so the unbound band, both singly bound bands, and the double band, I can actually estimate all the parameters for the individual binding affinities. I can tell whether the specificity changes for one protein when the other one is already present. I can measure cooperativity, and cooperativity is a function of the sequences. And all of that comes out of just cutting out four bands of a gel and sequencing. Here's the people who did the work. Xu Shang did the uh, uh, computational problem I talked about. Uh, Zheng Zhao did the lac uh, repressor work. Uh, Kenny is working on the combinatorial binding of two factors, and we had a great collaboration with Josh Swamidas. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah. So, uh, do you find variance in, in nature of the lactic press? The yes. Well, yeah, in, even in E. coli itself, there are two other operators. Uh, O1 is the, is the classic lac repressor. It sits on top of the promoter. But I said the protein is actually a tetramer, and it actually does looping. This was, I think, probably the first discovered case of DNA looping. And that's actually critical. But the other two binding sites, O2 and O3, one of which is upstream and one of which is actually within the coding region, are critical. If you knock those out, it, it, the system doesn't work. Um, or if you try to just bind it as a dimer, you make a mutant so it doesn't make a tetramer. So that's actually critical to the, to the activity. Uh, but in addition, so, so this consensus sequence, which is asymmetric, is actually conserved across species. And in fact, there's work not by us, but by Mitch Lewis and people that really says this really is optimal. I mean, I showed it was optimal in terms of binding, but it's actually optimal in terms of function. If you do selection for alternatives, they don't, they don't survive as well. Right. They are divers, they are not binding to DNA, and the DNA binding sites are asymmetrical with spacers. Well, those are, they, they, have cons they have symmetrical consensus sequences. They tolerate asymmetry, but the consensus is symmetric. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But nature has sampled across a variety of binding sites. Right. Yeah, I, I could comment on it, but it would take me a half an hour. So I should, I should pass and we can talk about it over lunch or something.